Welcome to uh, the CC Gurukul Lectures. I am Dr. Monica Prabhakar and I teach philosophy at Dalatram College, University of Delhi. Uh, the title of my lecture series is uh, Introduction to Indian Philosophy. And today I would be talking about tracing the beginnings of Indian philosophy. I have titled today's lecture as Tracing the Beginnings of Indian Philosophy as I would be taking you along in those distant times when the world's oldest scriptures were revealed to the inquisitive minds. But before that, let us understand what philosophy is. Philosophy begins with questioning and humans are curious by nature. This curiosity makes them ask questions. Some people get involved to the extent of becoming full-fledged philosophers, while others choose to restrain themselves from becoming so. A child at the age of about two or so also seems to begin with questioning and never stops asking why even if the adults get tired of answering. Each child then is an authentic philosopher. And this reminds me of a famous book called Sophie's World, in which the author, Jostein Gader, in a beautiful manner, compares philosopher's curiosity with the curiosity of a child. And in the same tenor, he compares the common man with the father of the child. Just as a child is ever amazed and enchanted to see the world and asks endless continuous questions, to her father. Similarly, a philosopher seeks to know each and every detail and remains engaged in the process of knowing. The father, on his part, gets irritated while answering those innocent questions and ultimately snubs her. Likewise, the ordinary people call a philosopher childish and laugh at him for seeking answers for irrelevant questions. Socrates was famous for asking provoking and endless questions to poets, politicians and others in positions of authority. In the end, they were so annoyed with him that they put him to trial and he was condemned to die by drinking hemlock. Let us return to the curiosity of the child. A child may begin with the question, what color is the sky? The parent answers blue. The child asks, what color is grass? The parent responds, green. To ask such a question, the child already has a concept of colors, though she may not be able to distinguish colors properly. When the parents answers, the child begins to distinguish colors and says the sky is blue and the ocean is blue. Now, she asks, they are both blue but not the same color. Why are they both called blue? Now the child has reached the stage of distinguishing between different shades of a color like blue. Now the child asks a more difficult question. Why is the sky blue? The parent takes some time. She may respond that it is due to a um, certain intensity of light which is measured in angstroms. But the child is smart. She says, you have told me what blue is, but you have not told me why it is blue. This means the child has some sense that everything has a cause. Where did this idea come from? Now, if the parent believes in God, she says, because God made it blue. But if she does not believe in God, she says, because it has evolved in nature to be blue. The child is not satisfied with either answer. The questions of what, inquiring about the essence of something and the questions of why, inquiring about the causes of something are deeply philosophical questions and we can say they are all scientific questions. Coming back to the answer that blue is the intensity of light measured in angstroms, the child may respond. I can see that it is blue, but I cannot see the intensity of light measured in angstroms. 
The parent now responds, reality and causes are sometimes transcendent. They are beyond our perception. And yet, we infer that they are the causes. We can now make the transition to the big philosophical questions such as what is the nature of ultimate reality? One answer in Indian philosophy by Vedantins is that it is Brahman. But what is Brahman? It is transcendental beyond our world of perception. The Charvakas, like the child, ask, If I cannot perceive it, then how can I have knowledge of the Brahman? How can you say that it is transcendental? Why should I believe you that Brahman is the ultimate reality? The Vedantin now responds, We live in a world of many beings and many minds, each seeing and perceiving similarity, uh, similarly and differently. The world that is transient and the knowledge that is attained in this world through perception and experience is also transient. Whereas the Brahman is the transcendental, in it everything is one. It is beyond perception and it is permanent, not transient. Hence, the knowledge within Brahman is absolute knowledge, not transient knowledge. The perspective of everything being one in the Brahman is often called monism. The Charvaka now responds, I think all knowledge comes from experience, from perception, how can you jump by uh, reasoning to uh, the existence of anything without any evidence? How is the knowledge of the Brahman attained? The Vedantin responds that it is revealed knowledge, revealed to the sages who are superhuman and the sages then are able to transmit it to, uh, to us through their powers. The Charvaka now responds, who is a sage? Why should I accept anyone as a sage? How do you distinguish an authentic sage from a pretender? How can the revealed knowledge received by any sage be verified? Why should I believe any sage? I simply do not accept any source of knowledge besides perception. Now the Vedantin and the Charvaka will now carry on the debate, each building more and more sophisticated arguments for their claims. As we can see, we have moved from a child's questions to a high order philosophical debate on the nature of ultimate reality. Now who wins the debate is not so important, but the activity of debate is central to philosophy. If any philosophical claim is immune to debate, then it is not really philosophical. Debates proceed through rigorous arguments. So, arguments are also essential to the activity of philosophy. Now, to close my introduction to what is philosophy, let me summarize a few points. Point 1. Philosophy begins with questions, with curiosity and the desire to know. Point number two. In answering and understanding answers, we move to definitions of concepts. Point number three. We also move to understanding distinctions, which distinctions to make and which not to make. And um, uh, there is never one answer to any philosophical question. Hence, we have debates about how a question like what is the ultimate reality is to be answered. Debates then are the lifeline of philosophy. In a good debate, each side does not simply state a claim and stomp their feet and say that their claim is correct. Rather, they build rigorous and intricate arguments to support their claims. Hence, arguments are essential for the activity of philosophy. 
Now, philosophy can also be defined in terms of the different branches of philosophy. Historically, there have been four branches of philosophy. There is metaphysics, epistemology, ethics and logic. Now, metaphysics deals with questions of what the world is made up of, what is real and what is illusion, what is permanent and what is transient, whether there is a final cause like God or there is not. The initial question may be, does the world exist? Some nihilists argue that nothing exists. Now, only in philosophy can such perspectives be entertained. And this is the greatest virtue of philosophy, as no perspective is preempted or censored by authority, making philosophy the most open-minded and open-ended of all disciplines. Interestingly, a nihilist cannot be refuted but there is no reason to accept a view just because it cannot be refuted. If we answer the question, does the world exist or does anything exist in the affirmative, then we move to questions like, what is the nature of the world? Further to questions like, is there a final cause of everything and so on. Now let us come to the second branch of philosophy, which is epistemology. And epistemology begins with the question, is knowledge possible? Again, some philosophers called the ultimate skeptics, who are called the ultimate skeptics, believe that knowledge is not possible. Again, within philosophy, we, we allow this as a perspective. Imagine if in a particular science like biology, there is a biologist who says that no knowledge in biology is possible there would not be much point in her studying biology then. This is, but this is not the case with philosophy. Why? Because, whereas in each discipline, we are restricted to a particular domain of knowledge. In philosophy, we go to a second level. What is knowledge? This question itself is a subject matter of philosophy and particularly an essential question for epistemology. In seeking knowledge of biology, physics or chemistry, the question of what is knowledge is not entertained, nor is an ultimate skeptic tolerated. We can have more moderate philosophical skepticism, which claims that anything you propose as knowledge, I can raise legitimate doubts about whether it is knowledge. The Charvaka's objections to the sage's knowledge discussed above are this type of uh, skepticism. If we agree that knowledge is possible, then we move to the questions of the nature of knowledge, the definition of knowledge and the distinction among different sources of knowledge. As we will see, all Indian schools of philosophy accept perception as a source of knowledge, but uh, there are long debates lasting centuries on the other purported sources of knowledge such as memory, inference, comparison and a verbal testimony. Now let us come to the third branch of philosophy which is called ethics. Ethics deals with questions of our actions. Is any action right or wrong? Again, since philosophy is broad-minded, we allow in ethics a perspective which begins with answering this question by no. This perspective is called moral relativism, in which what is right or what is wrong is relative to either culture or individual or simply to an emotional state. If we accept the answer yes, then our task is more difficult as a series of questions now ensue. What is right action in any given situation? 
how do we justify our action as being right? I will be presenting in later lectures the ethics of uh, the Bhagavad Gita which addresses these questions in a detailed manner. But let one thing be clear. Ethics is not about what is decided as right or wrong by someone outside me but it is about what I am to do in a particular difficult situation perhaps facing a moral dilemma as Arjuna does. If ethics was a mere following of commandments, then the whole Bhagavad Gita would be a useless text. Ethics involves a self-discovery, self-knowledge and self-realization. It is only when Arjuna goes through these stages that he comes to a point at the end where um, he can finally resolve his moral dilemma and do the right thing of joining the battle. The fourth branch of philosophy is called logic. Now logic is the basic methodology of constructing and criticizing arguments and building better and more logically sound arguments. As such, it is not a branch of philosophy, but historically, logic has been studied by philosophers. So we might as well consider it a branch of philosophy. Now, arguments are inferences from premises that are accepted to be true to conclusions, which hence must also be true if the arguments are valid. So, the basic activity of logic is to determine whether any constructed argument is valid or invalid. In later lectures, we will also be looking at various perspectives on Anuman or inference in various Indian philosophical schools. Now let's come to the question, what is Indian philosophy? Indian philosophy refers to the accumulated wisdom of those who belonged to India and claimed Indian heritage. And by India, I mean what we today call the subcontinent, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan and Sri Lanka, as the political divisions into nations came because of foreign invasions. And at the outset, I wish to clarify that Indian philosophy is not to be equated with Hindu religion. For there are atheistic as well as materialistic systems which are opposed to the basic tenets on which Hindu religion rests. Nonetheless, Hinduism is largely rooted in Indian philosophy. Hindu religion was initially called the Aridharm or the uh, for the Aryans who, who came from outside India, perhaps from the Arctic regions, settled in India and heavily contributed to the development of Indian thought and its way of life. It was also called Vedic Dharma, that is the Vedic way of life, Vedas being their sacred scriptures. However, the latter was rejected with the emergence of Buddhism and Jainism which developed as protest movements against the Vedic culture. By the way, Hindu, the word Hindu is not a Sanskrit word, nor does it appear anywhere in the Vedic scriptures. The word Hindu is a distorted form of the word Sindhu, the river, which we now call Indus. It is said that the Iranians and the Greeks pronounce the letter S as H which led to this naming of those who were settled on the banks and to the east of the river Sindhu as Hindus. When the Afghans and the Iranians became Muslims and came down to live in India, they were called Muslims, while the rest of the population was called the Hindus. Now let us come to the meaning of Indian philosophy. It means Darshan. It comes from the Sanskrit root drish, which means to see or a way of seeing. Thus, unlike Western philosophy, which is more about speculation, 
Indian philosophy is about experience or seeing the truth, which is why philosophers in India were called seers. See the self is most emphasized in mostly all schools of Indian philosophy. And the word darshan also means standpoint or perspective, which is why in India, philosophy is also called darshan shastra, a perspective to attain this vision of truth. Now, how did Indian philosophy emerge? The cause for the emergence of the systems of thought, whether theistic, atheistic or materialistic, was the search for the questions of life. Questions like what is the ultimate reality? How do we attain it? What is the purpose of life? What is this world? Why are we born? Why do we die? Why do we suffer? What is our ultimate end? How do we know all this? How should we act? The questions we just pondered over are both philosophical as well as religious. These questions needed deliberation, reflection and maturity of thought. So, the tradition divided man's life into four stages. What were the four stages of life? The stages of life were number one, Brahmacharya, two, Garhastya, three, Vanaprastha and four sannyas. I'll repeat Brahmacharya, Grahastya, Vanaprastha and sannyas. Now the first stage called Brahmacharya is that of a student. In this stage a child must live in the house or hermitage of the teacher until the education is over. The second stage Grahastya is that of the householder in which the child who is now grown up is asked by the teacher to go back to his house and pay the three debts. The first debt is to the forefathers which is paid back by marrying and having children. The second debt is to the teachers which is paid back by transmitting the acquired knowledge to the next generation. The third debt is to the gods and that is paid back by performing sacrifices. The sacrifice could be made through the oblation of butter or wheat or rice or barley into the fire. The third stage is Vanaprastya, which is that of a forest dweller. After paying the three debts and raising children till their adulthood, one can retire to the forest with his wife and ponder over the questions of life. For this is the time for self-reflection and self-discovery. The fourth stage and the last stage, which is sannyas, is the stage when one renounces every kind of attachment. He sends his wife back to the family, nothing attracts him anymore, he lives on begging and even changes his name so that he can disconnect with everything and remain absorbed in the search for the ultimate reality. It is to be noted that the last two stages are not obligatory in the sense that people uh, can attain spiritual knowledge without going through the last two stages. And there are examples in the scriptures which corroborate this. The great spiritual personalities like uh, King Janaka, Sage Yagyavalkya, Sage Vasishta, they were all householders. Women were dissuaded from entering into the last stage as this was considered quite hard and mm, harsh for them. But we can be sure that spiritual knowledge was open for women. For there is an interesting dialogue in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad between a husband and a wife on this issue of the attainment of spiritual knowledge. The name of the husband is Yagyavalkya and wife is Maitri. Now Yagyavalkya tells Maitri about his intention of taking sannyas and expresses his desire to divide his wealth between Maitri and his second wife Katyayani so that he can put an end to all the worldly ties. Maitri, who is more spiritually oriented, 
asks a simple question from Yagyavalkya. She says, If indeed this earth full of wealth be mine, shall I be immortal through that? Yagyavalkya says, No, there cannot be any hope of immortality through wealth. Then Maitri asks Yagyavalkya, What shall I do with that which will not make me immortal? Pleased with her words, Yagyavalkya asks her to come and sit down and reflect on what he explains. And there is a long conversation in which Yagyavalkya imparts spiritual knowledge about the immortality of the soul, the oneness of everything with the ultimate reality that is Brahman to Maitri. After this, Yagyavalkya leaves his home to take sannyas and Maitri takes to spiritual life. A mention needs to be made here regarding the fourfold division of Varna which divided the society into Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras and each Varna was accorded its own set of duties. At the time of Manu, this division based on Varna became quite rigid. However, in the Bhagavad Gita, it was clarified that this division was only in accordance with one's profession and not by birth. The Creator made all men equal but not similar. Every individual in the world is born with guna and swabhav, that is, attributes and nature, which ultimately determine his actions and profession. And thus, he belongs to one of the four varnas. If one abandons his varna-linked avocation, he disturbs the peace and harmony of the society, for he is not a justly performing his role in the society. The Bhagavad Gita therefore says, it is better to do one's own dharma or duty badly than that of another well. And we have seen many instances in the history of India where many people who were Shudra by birth became great emperors. Now let us come to another interesting question and it is, is philosophy the same as religion? I stated earlier that Indian philosophy is not to be equated with Hindu religion. But it is important to know that philosophy and religion began as one in India. However, um, soon they took different routes but the two paths did not oppose each other. The purpose of religion is to instill devotion in one's heart for God and the aim of philosophy is to make one understand the nature of reality. The final objective of both is just the same and that is liberation or moksha or nirvana which means release from the cycle of birth and death. Religion prepares one by purifying his or her thoughts, emotions and attitude towards the world, whereas philosophy perfects a person's understanding and helps him realize his true nature. Thus, it is the quest for the ultimate which keeps religion and philosophy tied to each other in India. Religion proposes a philosophic monotheism, meaning that there is one creator, which is evident in the Vedic hymns, and philosophy offers a monistic view which comes from the Upanishads and which says that there is only one reality. Now what all this, uh, all this means will be clear as we move on to the later sections. But first, let us understand what is the relation of Vedas to the Astika and Nastika traditions. The classical systems of Indian philosophy have been classified into Astika and Nastika schools. The Astika schools accept the authority of the Vedas, while the Nastika reject their authority. So, we can see that 
all schools whether astika or nastika are somehow focused on uh, to the vedas positively or negatively now the nastika schools include charvak buddhism and jainism and the astika schools include nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga purvamamsa and uttar mimamsa now is it becomes necessary for us to discuss as to what sort of knowledge is stored in the vedas now let us understand um what what vedas are the word veda means knowledge and vedas are the ancient sacred texts full of knowledge and which is why we say that vedas gave birth to indian philosophy unfortunately not much is known about the vedic period but whatever is known confirms of our rich he- uh, cultural heritage the truth contained in the vedas is the eternal cosmic truth which doesn't have a human origin and the seers to whom the truths in the vedas were revealed were merely instruments for the transmitting that knowledge to the generations to come these seers did not belong to any one particular class or gender nor did they belong to any particular time and that is why the whole vedic corpus extends over a period of 2000 years It is also interesting to note that Vedic teachings were basically oral teachings and after a very long period of time they were compiled into books and given their present form. The Vedic period had a sacrifice and ritual based religion. The sacrifices or rituals were conducted with full diligence. and accuracy as nothing written was available for reference and verification the primary purpose of these sacrifices was to maintain cosmic order and um it was a cosmic duty of the individuals to perform them and that is why the sacrifices were addressed to natural forces like the sun the rain the lightning the wind which were considered as gods and goddesses now let us turn our attention to the vedic literature here it is important to know the distinction between shruti and smriti shruti means what is heard and smriti means what is composed or remembered vedas are therefore shruti because they consist of revealed knowledge which was handed down from the gurus to their students orally smritis on the other hand have a human origin and manu smriti the epics ramayana and mahabharata and the puranas come under the category of the smriti literature now vedic literature is divided into four parts one mantras or samhitas two brahmanas three aranyakas and four upanishads mantra of course you know is a hymn addressed to a god or a goddess and the collection of the mantras is called samhita there are four samhitas and i'm sure you all must be aware of their names they are Rig Veda Samhita, Sam Veda Samhita, Yajur Veda Samhita, and Atharva Veda Samhita. These were compiled for the smooth performance of sacrifices. Now let us see what is given in these four samhitas. Let us start with the Rig Veda. It is the most important and the oldest of all the four samhitas. The reason why it is considered most important is that the content of every other samhita is either similar to that of Rigveda or is only an extension of Rigveda. Also, 
um, whenever any mention is made about the Vedic scriptures, the name of Rig Veda always comes first. Now, Rig Veda has more than 1000 hymns, which are invocations and invitations to God. They are simple outpourings of heart to invite God. Sama Veda, which is the second Veda, is the songbook of the Vedic rituals. The hymns of the Sama Veda are devotional in nature, which are basically to please gods. Yajur Veda is a combination of both prose and poetry and consists of the sacrificial formulas relating to the performance of the sacrifices. Atharva Ved, which is the last Ved, is generally regarded as a later addition to the Vedic canon, again in both prose and poetry. It is considered to have a dual aspect, holy as well as unholy. And there are songs and spells for the healing of diseases, for long life and health. But along with that, there are philosophical hymns as well. Coming back to the performance of sacrifices. Four main priests specialized in the four Samhitas were assigned the duty of performing the whole sacrifice in a disciplined manner. The first priest called Hota, dedicated to Rig Veda, would chant hymns in praise of the gods to invoke their presence and participation in the sacrifice. The second priest called Udgata, well versed in Samveda, would sing the hymns in sweet musical tones to amuse and please the gods. The third, specialized in Yajurved, called Adharvaryu, would perform the sacrifice in accordance with the stri uh, strict ritualistic formulas and give offerings to God. The fourth priest, called Brahma, expert in Atharva Veda, would do the general supervision of the whole performance of the sacrifice. Now it is time to talk about a portion of the Vedic literature known as the Sutras. These are regarded as the connecting link between the Vedic and the post-Vedic period. The sutras provide information regarding the social, economic and religious aspects of the Indian culture. And most uh, significant works of the sutra literature are called the Vedangas or the auxiliary sciences of the Vedas. The Vedangas are divided into six parts. One, Shiksha or phonetics, 2. Kalpa or ritual instructions, 3. Vyakarana or grammar, 4. Nirukta or etymology, 5. Chanda or poetic meters and 6. Jyotish or astrology and astronomy. Now, Shiksha or phonetics concerns with the proper pronunciation of the words. Unless a word is properly pronounced, it does not make any sense, nor can it produce the desired result. Kalpa, which is the second Vedanga, is ritual instruction. It concerns with the procedures for the Vedic rituals associated with major events in life of an individual like um, marriage, birth and death and it also concerns with uh, the duties that a person ought to perform in the various stages of his life. The third Vyakarana or grammar is essential for understanding the basic ideas conveyed by the Vedic verses. For how can a person know the meaning of any sentence if it is not grammatically correct? So, Vyakarana is important. The fourth, Nirukta or etymology is regarding the explanation of words which are unclear so that the meaning of words can be understood in the proper context. Fifth, Chanda or poetic meters are important as far as the chanting of Vedic hymns, are, uh, hymns is concerned. The hymn can bring its fruit only if it is sung or chanted in its specific meter or pattern. And the last is Jyotish or Astrology and Astronomy. Uh, 
It helps in calculating the astronomical details of the celestial bodies and gives the right time for performing the sacrifices. So we can see that these Vedangas make the understanding of the Vedas clear, easy and fruit bearing. Let us now understand the second kind of Vedic literature which is called Brahmana. The Brahmanas are the starting point of Indian philosophy. It is said that um, without the knowledge of the Brahmanas, one cannot understand Indian religion, philosophy and the importance of symbols, myths and narratives in Indian literature. Each Samhita possesses one or more Brahmanas. They are basically the elaboration of the complicated ritualism of the Vedas. It was considered important to understand the significance of the performance of the rituals and the way they were conducted. The appendages to these Brahmanas are the Aranyakas. The word Aranyaka means a text composed or read in the calmness of the forest. Whereas the Brahmanas discuss uh, the rituals or the sacrifices to be performed by the householders, the Aranyakas give a preliminary training to those who aspire spiritual knowledge and want relief from the cycle of birth and death. It is mainly for the Vanaprasthas. Thus, the Aranyakas mark a transition from ritualism to philosophical thinking. Now the concluding portions of the Aranyakas are the Upanishads. Upanishads signify knowledge which loosens completely the bondage of the world and enables the learner, the seeker to attain the self, the ultimate reality, the Brahman. Upanishads are the closing part of the Vedic literature and so they are called Vedanta. They reveal the highest form of knowledge and the ultimate goal of the Vedas which is moksha or merging with the supreme reality which is Sat, Chit, Anand, Truth, Consciousness, Bliss. The mantras and the brahmanas are called the karmakand of the Vedas as they uh, both deal with ritualistic performances. The Aranyakas and the Upanishads are called Jnanakand of the Vedas as they are the portions that concern with knowledge. Here a realization comes that uh, the ancient seers arranged the whole Vedic literature in conformity with the four stages of life. So, the Indian philosophical thought can very well be traced in the transition from the mantra to the Brahmana to the Aranyaka and finally in the Upanishads. Now let's come to the most important question and that is what have we inferred from this? And I want to suggest that we have inferred a gradual transition from the naturalistic and anthropomorphic polytheism through monotheism to monism. Now again an important question, what does this mean? It, it, it sounds so complicated. And um, to give you some relief, I want to tell you that it means that the pre-Upanishadic philosopher on seeing the various phenomena of nature like the rising and setting of the sun, the rain, gathering of clouds in the sky, lightning, waxing and waning of the moon, was able to establish the principle of causality and believed in the existence of gods associated with each of these phenomena. And he glorified these gods as mighty and powerful but did not give any form to them. To take the example of the sun god, he is described as golden-handed, seated on a chariot of seven horses and that's it, there is no more description. With time, however, the, these majestic and um, mighty gods were personified and given an anthropomorphic form. This is evident in many poetic hymns in which gods are praised about their looks. 
but the philosophical mind of these people was not satisfied with such a conception of many gods or as it is called polytheism so their philosophical tendency led them from polytheism to monotheism and monotheism is the belief that there must be one divine power that works through all the gods whether it is indra or varuna or agni thus one comprehensive god was conceived as the creator of the whole cosmos some people were satisfied with this monotheistic explanation of the cosmos while others were still in search for the answer about the ultimate reality and then they conceived of an infinite eternal unitary principle the brahman who is in all and all are in him thus monism was ultimately sought as an answer to all the queries and monism is what is discussed at length in the upanishads now to lighten up this whole discussion i would like to narrate a small story from the chandogya upanishad there is the sweet child shweta ketu who was little naughty boy it was a little naughty boy who had no intentions of going to uh, the guru's hermitage for education um his father sage uddalaka um scolded him once very badly and disturbed by the anger of his father shweta ketu left his home in search of a guru now after completing his education on the vedas and the vedangas when he returned to his father's house uddalaka found that shweta ketu had now become very arrogant and proud of his knowledge to set his feet on ground uddalaka asked shweta ketu whether he received the great instructions from his guru shweta ketu was perplexed as he had never heard of this expression before and he asked his father about its meaning uddalaka then said to him that the veda and the vedangas that he learnt at the hermitage of his guru consisted of aparavidya or the non supreme knowledge and what he now wishes to teach him is paravidya or supreme knowledge immediately the proud demeanor of shweta ketu changed and he humbly asked his father to tell him about the supreme knowledge of the upanishads and this is where i will end my lecture today and next time will tell you the significance of the upanishadic philosophy which uddalaka calls paravidya thank you so much